Felix, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad and, uh, and honored to be here. Uh, I understand from, from uh, Marcus' uh, transition that I will be the only one, the only one to comment on uh, Hans Werner's presentation, <laughs> which, uh, which uh, I don't know is a, is a blessing or, or a curse. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. Uh, I have to say I agree with many of the, uh, of the, of the points made by Hans Werner, not all of them, as you, as you can imagine, uh, and I will, I will come back to that in my uh, uh, but I certainly agree with part of the conclusion, in particular uh, on, the, on the fiscal side. I will come back to that. So the, uh, um, what I would like to do now is to um, to put this discussion on current account balances and on targets uh, against a broader perspective. And the way I would like to do it now is to uh, to reinterpret uh, the European crisis uh, by speaking about the mechanisms to share risks within the within the European Union and within, within the EMU. So uh, this will all be about risk sharing mechanisms within EMU, uh, first before the crisis, uh, second uh, during the crisis, and this is very much what, uh, what uh, Hans Werner has described, and uh, also uh, as a conclusion after the crisis. And then I will move to the policy, uh, to some policy considerations on how to, um, how to make the uh, European system work better. So the, the first part will be about the, uh, the risk sharing mechanisms uh, before the crisis. Um, I'm not going to expand too much on that. Um, as, you, as, as you all know very well, the, uh, the, ar the architects of the Euro, uh, those who wrote the, uh, the, de the dollar grid report, uh, and then the uh, one market, one money report in the early 90s, uh, and then uh, those who wrote the, the Maastricht Treaty uh, in 1992, um, they were all, all well aware of the theory of optimum currency areas, uh, and they were well aware of the conclusions uh, of, the, of the academic thinking at the time, here I'm speaking of the early 90s. Um, and so they, they expected firms and households house in the euro area to, um, to respond much less, less flexibly to shocks than, than in the US uh, for many reasons. Uh, <coughs> financial markets were comparatively less developed in Europe, so there was less risk sharing going on through, uh, through investments by, uh, by households. And also, uh, labor markets were more rigid, uh, and they are still more rigid. Um, the low, low mobility of labor uh, across uh, European countries was rather low, and uh, maybe even more importantly, uh, there, was, <coughs> there was no federal system uh, of, uh, of taxes and transfers, and this is something that uh, highlighted at the end of the presentation. <coughs> it, was, it was a very different environment to, uh, to set up and, uh, and run a monetary union. <coughs> Uh, to, to cope with this situation, uh, European gov governments have taken a different, uh, a different route. Uh, they, have, uh, they have kind of accepted uh, the, the low flexibility of markets and the, uh, the absence uh, of, the, uh, of the underdevelopment of risk sharing mechanisms through markets. And this has been taken as granted at the beginning of the European uh, Monetary Union. And um, to address this lack of flexibility, uh, they have uh, bound themselves uh, to foster uh, economic policy cooperation uh, through the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, they have committed to, uh, to foster flexibility within their economies to, to, uh, to, uh, to catch up uh, against the US and to make uh, reassuring mechanisms work better. And we'll see how this worked uh, uh, after 1999. And even more importantly, uh, governments have adopted fiscal rules. Uh, so uh, they have the, 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 the big bets they made uh, is to was to bet on uh, on self insurance uh, through intertemporal risk sharing at a, at a country level uh, with balanced budget rules and uh, uh, stable debt rules uh, through the uh, economic and growth pact. Uh, so they believed that most of the risk sharing mechanism could happen at the national level intertemporally, uh, and they, they gave up to some extent on the possibility to have a cross country uh, risk sharing mechanisms uh, either through through uh, fiscal institutions <laughs> at the federal level. <laughs> or uh, decentralized levels through, uh, through market. Um, so this was, the, this was the starting point in, uh, in 1999. So what, what did we actually see uh, in the first years of, of EMU uh, before, let's say, between 1999 and 2007 when the, when the financial crisis uh, erupted? Um, well, we've seen some integration of, of goods and, of, of good and services markets. Um, but this was probably mainly due to previous commitments to the single European Act, which was uh, decided in 1987 and implemented in 92. Uh, it may have been to some, to some extent uh, due to the, to the endogenous consequences of monetary union, but as you know, this is uh, debated. 
uh, there may have been uh, some more uh, uh, some more trade in terms of volume and also the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the composition of uh, trade within the euro area may have changed with maybe uh, more trade at the, at the extensive margin, somewhat more trade at the intensive margin and a lot more trade at the extensive margin. But it's more about the composition than about the, the value of the volume. And it's very hard to, to, to say that the monetary union as such has uh, led to, uh, 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 has created a strong drive for further integration of, uh, of markets for human services. When it comes to labor markets, uh, well, here the, the news are not very good. They've remained very rigid uh, in, most, uh, in most countries. Uh, labor has remained uh, immobile across Europe. Uh, and you know all this uh, nice empirical research uh, on, the, on the reaction of the labor markets to shocks as compared in the US and in, in the euro area, uh, which shows that the, uh, the, uh, the contribution of labor mobility to, to absorbing shocks to the labor markets uh, is much higher in the US than in Europe even though it may also have increased uh, somewhat uh, after the introduction of the euro, probably not, uh, not very much so. And what we've seen in Europe is that most of the reaction to shocks through the labor market has come through obtaining uh, the participation rates. We've seen that again uh, through the, the labor crisis, by the way, uh, in countries like Germany or France, where you've seen uh, changes occurring through Kurzarbeit, uh, uh, through uh, work time, uh, to some extent through conversations, but not at all through labor mobility. The mechanisms are very different and they have not changed a lot uh, since 1990. Uh, and um, we haven't seen strong steps uh, towards uh, reforming labor markets, towards introducing more flexibility in the labor markets, except maybe in Germany, uh, in the uh, uh, government, uh, but in other countries we haven't seen that. We are seeing that now, but this will be uh, later in the story. We think that, uh, as you know, in detail, uh, I can address later. Um, so again, this was very much adjustment at the country level through mechanisms within countries and not a lot of, uh, of risk sharing across countries. Um, then, uh, when it comes to the fiscal performance, where it's very well known that uh, uh, many countries had entered the EU with a high level of debt, uh, and uh, they've done little or nothing to, to address that. Uh, they've done little or nothing to reduce debt uh, after uh, entering the euro. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio in France was 57% uh, of GDP in 2000. It was 64% of GDP in 2006, uh, <coughs> before the crisis. Uh, same in Germany, 60% in uh, 2000 and 68% in 2006. Uh, same in uh, Italy, uh, Greece, etc. Uh, there was no, uh, no substantial efforts to reduce uh, the level of debt to, to make room, to create room, uh, to adapt to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to we create fiscal space uh, after the, uh, the, 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 the Well, of course, the device which was meant to, to implement this kind of fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, discipline was the Stability and Growth Pact, which was created in, uh, in 1998, and uh, it hasn't really worked. Uh, so it will work in the future, but it doesn't work very well uh, uh, between 1999 and 2000. Um, so now, but now the last point, which may be the, more, the most surprising one, is that something still has happened, and uh, this is the development of, uh, of uh, integration of uh, financial markets. So the point I would like to make here is that we haven't seen much integration in the markets for goods and services. We haven't seen much integration and much flexibility in the labor market. We haven't seen much effort to put fiscal uh, conditions on a more sustainable footing. But we've seen a lot of integration going on through the school campus. <coughs> may have been the biggest surprise uh, when, as compared to what was initially uh, uh, envisaged. So we, we have at the ECB a set of indicators for financial market integration in Europe. We have this report on the financial integration in Europe. And the latest one has been released uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's on the website. There is a lot of uh, cross-country and uh, cross uh, uh, markets information <coughs> on convergence, both before the crisis and after the crisis. Well, and after the crisis, I'll come back to that a little bit later because this has not been convergence, but divergence, i come back to that. But let, let me just uh, sum up and say that before the crisis, we've seen a lot of convergence in money markets. Uh, we've seen a convergence in bond markets. This has been highlighted in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, we've seen some uh, convergence also in uh, some integration in equity markets, even though they remain more fragmented uh, than uh, either bond, uh, money markets or bond markets, uh, through uh, a, a series of regulatory initiatives. Uh, 
financial services actually plan the solar funds to report, etc. We've seen, we've seen a, a substantial political drive to, to, to accelerate the integration of financial markets. Just to give you an example, the share of, uh, of equity <coughs> issued by euro area residents and held by residents of other euro area countries, so cross-country cross uh, equity holding, uh, this share has doubled between 1997 and 2006 uh, from 15% in, in 1997 to uh, 30% in 2006. So we've seen a lot of evidence of uh, accelerated integration uh, of financial markets. And maybe the most striking sign of, uh, of, uh, market, of financial market integration and, and therefore of risk sharing through financial markets in, uh, uh, in the first years of EMU uh, were the current account deficit and surpluses, which, uh, which Hans Werner has, has, has described. Uh, and I, uh, I, I agree very, very much with the description. Um, we've, seen, uh, we've seen a large current account deficits uh, being piled up, uh, being financed internally within the euro area mostly not so much uh, through uh, international capital markets, but a lot within the euro area. Uh, just to give you a, a, few, a few figures, uh, Greece uh, saw its current account deficit rise from 7% uh, of GDP to 15% of GDP uh, before the crisis. Spain from 3% to 12%. Uh, Ireland uh, from 0 to 7%. And this was very much the, the figures that were shown. Portugal from 3% to uh, so these deficits were financed by, uh, by European markets and uh, largely by investors from a single country, which was Germany. This is very much the story. Why are France typically? And we so lend to your bank and you send the money to the public. Yeah, or via Ireland also, in some, in some, in some cases. <coughs> I come back to, invest, uh, to, to investors' behavior in Germany. I come back to that later. <laughs> um, um, so uh, we, we've seen the, uh, uh, in the first years of EMU, we've seen the, uh, the, uh, the, the Feldstein Oreo campus uh, disappearing, so to speak, and this was uh, nicely highlighted uh, very early uh, on by, uh, by Olivier Blanchard and Francesco Ferretti, among others. Uh, so that, that at the face of it, there was, there was a simple a theoretical explanation, it was just a convergence, productivity catch-up, and the need for uh, less uh, wealthy countries to, to accumulate. And, uh, and this was good. I mean, if, the, if this was that story, then it was perfectly okay that a capital would flow to, to Portugal, uh, Spain, uh, and Greece uh, to help build up capital and catch up uh, productivity, productivity levels. Um, the problem is that we, we really could see two phases. Uh, so this is convergence or catch up story was, was probably the case in the early years of, uh, of EMU. Uh, but then at some point there was some, uh, there was some uh, 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 overshooting uh, and so the, the, it was not as much about investing in, uh, in, in uh, productive capacities in these countries and there were increasing signs that um, uh, high GDP growth rates in these countries were not accompanied by uh, comparable developments in productivity. That's probably the case in the early years of the EMU, but uh, beginning from the, the mid 2000s I would say uh, increasingly, capital in inflows were not accompanied by uh, uh, comparable development in productivity. And even, even more worryingly, uh, current account deficits were, were amplified, were exacerbated by expectations of future revenue, re revenues in these countries, uh, which were not, uh, not revealed. Uh, and this may have been encouraged by a, by a globally uh, a benign uh, uh, economic environment. So it's not only a European story. This was a time where the whole uh, uh, economic environment was very supportive, because of moderation uh, and uh, capital was flowing everywhere. But still, you have this particular European dimension of um, uh, current account uh, 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 opening up, widening, uh, because of unsustainable expectations of revenues in, uh, in some European countries. Uh, and as this boom uh, uh, continued and expanded, uh, we've seen also a gap in relative prices. So I'm not going to, to go into the details. This was nicely shown by uh, by Frank Werner. We've seen the divergence uh, of uh, unit labor costs between Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain on the one hand, and uh, 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 core European countries, and in particular Germany uh, on the other. Um, and so the, the, uh, with the benefit of insight, of course, is the magnitude of, uh, of the current account uh, deficits and surpluses, and also the magnitude of the gap in relative prices should have been uh, interpreted. Uh, should have been a warning, uh, but uh, Um, so, um, so the, the, the conclusion here is that we've, uh, maybe the, the only uh, well-functioning uh, risk-sharing mechanism that we've seen in the, uh, uh, in the early years of EMU 
was uh, integration into financial markets. Uh, why did it turn badly? Well, there was an outside shock in 2007, of course, but uh, probably uh, the fact that we had so much investment uh, in, uh, in, in countries uh, with, with, uh, which was not accompanied by high productivity growth was also the reflection of, uh, of bad risk management uh, of these investments. So uh, I would say that there is a shared responsibility between the borrowers and the lenders. Uh, you have to be uh, in the tango. Uh, and so uh, there was also responsibility of those investors, and including French investors, German investors, investors from, from <coughs> more wealthy countries at the time, uh, which invested uh, without uh, adequate risk management uh, in, uh, in uh, And also, most likely a lack of a regulatory uh, oversight uh, or a lack of, uh, of understanding that uh, uh, this resulted in a hidden liabilities uh, developing uh, throughout the system. Uh, hidden liabilities were developing uh, in countries uh, which were filing up debt, and it was not very well understood, it was not properly understood that these liabilities, uh, even though they had originated in the private sector, because it were private investments, would eventually migrate to, to the balance sheets of governments uh, when they would assume a system. This was not very well understood. So the, uh, the impact uh, on, uh, uh, on government balance sheets and the, the, uh, the ultimate impact on debts and deficits was not understood at the time. It was very much felt as a, as a private sector uh, issue. Um, so uh, this is very much the situation uh, that we had before the crisis. And of course, uh, there was a major, uh, the, there was a major uh, fragility, uh, which was this, this dependence on, uh, on, uh, on financial markets to achieve uh, risk sharing, uh, which made the whole system very vulnerable uh, when the uh, financial markets uh, uh, stopped functioning uh, in 2007. Uh, this, was a, this was a major uh, fragility. And uh, uh, probably uh, um, insufficient attention was paid to the possibilities that markets would uh, could any, at any time uh, become segmented along national borders. Uh, and uh, so the fault lines, in fact, were very apparent because the fault lines were just national borders, and so which we should have been uh, So what happened during the, 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 the crisis? Uh, we've seen a collapse uh, in, uh, in uh, all segments of financial markets in Europe, and you know, you remember the story, I'm not going to Again, uh, we've seen the, uh, the interbank market uh, freezing, uh, in particular the unsecured interbank market froze in 2007, <laughs> and when it, when it came back, it did come back in 2008, 2009, but when it came back, uh, it came back uh, in a fragmented way, and very much fragmented along national borders. And we, we also see, we also could see a deterioration in the, in the secured uh, interbank market, uh, in, for instance in the repo market, uh, 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 which we can still see, even though there has been some recovery uh, and some, uh, some uh, um, uh, even though the repo spreads have come back to, uh, towards normality, to some extent, the volumes in the repo market are not at all the same as they were before. So this is permanent impact also on the secure uh, internet market. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen divergence in yields uh, on money markets, we've seen divergence in yields on government bond markets, uh, of course. Uh, we've seen uh, cross-border holdings of bonds uh, by European banks uh, being partially unwound, contrary to what happened before the crisis. Uh, and increasingly, we are seeing uh, pan-European banking groups uh, tem tempted to, uh, to, uh, to pool liquidity uh, within countries, to segregate liquidity within countries, to manage national pools of liquidity, uh, contrary to the period before the crisis where they had single pool of liquidity. These are all evidences of, uh, of fragmentation and, uh, and segmentation. Uh, in equity markets, uh, the impact of the financial crisis seems to have to be more limited. Uh, we don't see a major impact of the financial crisis on cross-border integration of equity markets. But overall, when you look at the global picture, much of the, the pre-crisis uh, progress uh, in terms of uh, European financial integration has been has been destroyed. Um, so. Of course, uh, since this was the, the only properly functioning uh, risk sharing mechanism uh, after 2007, and even more so after 2010, uh, when, the, when the sovereign crisis hit, uh, the euro area was left without uh, risk sharing around. Uh, this is when the, uh, the, uh, the public institutions of the euro area stepped in, and here I'm getting closer to Andrea's uh, presentation. 
Uh, we've seen uh, assistance packages by, the, uh, by governments, uh, and by European governments, and by the, by the IMF. Uh, so the EFSF and the IMF uh, have uh, provided uh, uh, financing to Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. So you could, you could call that exposed risk, uh, risk sharing, in a sense. Uh, there was, this was not uh, prepared ex ante, but exposed uh, governments uh, and the IMF had to, uh, had to step in. Uh, there were also policy actions which were not uh, directly related to funding, but with, which have been taken to, to restore confidence uh, in, uh, uh, in the soundness of countries and in the soundness of bonds. Just to give you an example, we have the, uh, the stress tests and the capital exercise of the European Funding Authority last year of the EBA uh, with, the, with this uh, target for a 0.9% uh, forty one ratio uh, in July 2012. This is not about financing, but it is, it is an initiative. aiming at restoring the ability of banks to, uh, to finance the, uh, to finance uh, When it comes to the, to the ECB, to the euro system, uh, we've, taken, uh, we've taken measures uh, to, um, to ensure the transmission of monetary policy across uh, European economies and uh, to ensure a smooth functioning of the payment system uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and this has, in effect, resulted in uh, the ECB, uh, to some extent, or to a large extent, substituting for the euro area interbank market, which is the story that, that uh, Andrea has put forward. Uh, but uh, the, the reasons uh, here are really about monetary policy. This is about uh, ensuring the uniform transmission of monetary policy everywhere in the euro area. So it, 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 it was not acceptable from the, from the, from the point of view of the, of the ECB, which is the <coughs> the euro area, and which is running a single monetary policy in the euro area. Not, it would not have been acceptable to see uh, monetary policy signals being transmitted in some countries and not, not in some others. And with the crisis, with, with uh, the, uh, the uh, impairment of financial markets in Europe, uh, there was a, uh, a whole uh, um, part of the euro area where monetary policy signals were not being transmitted anymore because money markets were not working and uh, bond markets were not uh, working either. So we've taken a series of measures. Uh, we've cut uh, the policy uh, interest rate to, uh, to to very low level. To a very low level, uh, we've provided um, we've provided uh, reserves to bank uh, at a fixed rate and with a full allotment, meaning that we've chosen to uh, to match uh, fully uh, the increase in the, in the in the bank's demand for reserves. This has been matched fully by the uh, by the ECB. This is a fixed rate full allotment. Um, and uh, as you know, we've, like, we, we've lengthened the maturity at which we provide reserves to bank uh, by launching a two or three year uh, refinancing operation. The, the uh, so the reason for that is first, uh, as I mentioned already, to ensure the, the uniform or more uniform at least uh, transmission of monetary policy by matching the demand for reserves originating in uh, countries where the interbank where the inter market was not functioning anymore. Uh, this was a way also to, uh, to prevent uh, deflationary pressures. Uh, the, 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 the basic reason why we decided on the ATFO uh, in, uh, in November of 2011 is that uh, market-based funding was becoming very scarce for European banks, and uh, there was a very substantial risk of uh, European banks being cut off uh, from international markets and uh, having to, uh, to, de to deleverage in a disorderly way uh, which would have resulted in a, in a significant difference in bank lending to the economy, and this would have caused great for, for, for bank lending. So there is, a, there is a price stability argument, which is that the, uh, the situation in, uh, in the autumn of 2011 was a situation of a near uh, credit crunch uh, in, uh, in a large part of the euro area economy, and without action from the ECB, uh, the credit crunch would have materialized uh, and would have seen Um, and also, at, uh, at times, uh, we have uh, undertaken direct interventions on, in selected financial markets. We have set up a program to buy covered bonds, uh, but with limited amount. And as you know, uh, we, we have set up a program to uh, intervene on uh, some government bond markets where uh, the, uh, the increase in yields was uh, considered an obstacle to, to, to the transmission of monetary uh, policy. And this is the securities market program, the SNP. Um, well, of course, the, the, the effect of this policy was, uh, was very different across uh, European countries. 
typically the banks that were experiencing the most severe uh, funding strains uh, were operating in countries uh, which were the same countries which, which run uh, which <coughs> have large current account deficits, and you've seen the, you've seen the figure. So you had a conjunction of current account deficits and capital deficits. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the purpose of the, uh, of the intervention of the ECB was to ensure that each bank in the euro area, irrespective of its location, uh, irrespective of its, of its country, uh, would have sufficient reserves uh, to, uh, to deal with the possibility that the creditors uh, may, may refuse to roll over loans. So it was really a way to address the situation of each individual bank in the euro area, irrespective uh, of, the, uh, of the country. Um, so uh, this has resulted in the, uh, in the target two imbalances, which Sean uh, Werner has, uh, has uh, very, very uh, precisely um, uh, described. Uh, target two is the, uh, is the clearing and settlement system uh, operated by the ECB for, uh, for large value uh, flows uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so national central banks in the euro area can build up claims vis-a-vis -vis, uh, target two over time. But target two is only the mirror of the underlying economic and financial imbalances. Target two is a mirror of current account deficits and capital account deficits. Uh, if the interbank market was, was functioning properly, uh, no claim would appear in target two, and it was very much in the situation uh, until uh, 2007, uh, when the financial crisis erupted. Uh, so we, we, we would see nothing in target two, and the, un underlying, the underlying economic issues would be exactly the same. We would have the same current account issues, we would have the same uh, capital account issues, but this would not be seen in, uh, in, uh, in target two. So this is for me the evidence that uh, addressing, trying to address the European crisis through, uh, uh, by, by acting on target two, by constraining the flow of funds uh, through target two, uh, this would be addressing the symptoms of the crisis without addressing the causes. And we, we should really focus on current account imbalances and on capital account imbalances, meaning uh, the functioning of uh, if we constrain the functioning of target two, uh, we will hamper the freedom of capital, of capital movements in Europe, which is a which is the freedom uh, in, the, uh, in the European treaties. And uh, we, would, we would hamper the smooth operation of payment systems, which is, which is one of the core tasks of the ECB. So the role of the ECB here is not to, it's not to, to finance current account deficits or to finance capital account deficits. This is the, this is the outcome in the aggregate. Uh, but the role of the ECB is to make sure that each bank in the euro area uh, has uh, uh, enough liquidity uh, to, uh, to, to, to do its job, uh, meaning to finance the economy uh, and to, uh, to, uh, to uh, keep the economy going. So the role of the ECB is really a microeconomic job. We don't have a macroeconomic job. Uh, the ECB only talks with, with, uh, with the two bank. Uh, and let me also, uh, just as a reaction to, to, to the earlier presentation, uh, let me mention that there is no money creation in any uh, single uh, euro area country. Money is being created by the ECB. Uh, uh, it is being distributed by national or central banks and then lent to individual banking institutions. But there is no money being created in Athens or in Lisbon or in, uh, and no, no money being destroyed in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Frankfurt. It's a unified system. It's, it's so what is money creation? Because the, the national central banks are the agents of the euro system, uh, to, it's a decentralized system, so, so, so they are, the, they are the, the, the operators which, uh, which uh, implement uh, the, uh, the distribution of liquidity uh, to, uh, to national banks. But it's a unified system. So if, we, if, if, in, uh, if in 1999 the founding fathers of Europe had chosen to have an integrated system, uh, as, in, uh, as it is the case in, uh, in, any, uh, in any country, uh, then, uh, so if, uh, if, uh, um, if uh, Sao Paulo in Tessa would borrow uh, directly from the ECB in Frankfurt instead from borrowing from the, from the Bank of Italy in Rome, uh, then the, the outcome in terms of monetary policy uh, and in terms of liquidity distribution would be exactly the same. Uh, we wouldn't have target two at all. Uh, this would be a purely uh, internal device. You wouldn't see anything uh, in the uh, balance sheet of LCBs because you wouldn't have LCBs anymore, and the system would be functioning exactly the same. Exactly the same. So you, so you have you have two diff you have two totally different set of issues. You have the organization, uh, the institutional organization of monetary policy in Europe, which is decentralized, uh, and so we have this system which is unique, but this is due to the. Your area is unique uh, uh, generally, 
uh, with a uh, with a, a centralized decision making by the European Council of the ECB, and then decentralized uh, implementation by the National Central Council. And then you have a completely different question, which is uh, the functioning of the markets and the fact that the markets are not functioning. And uh, this, is, this is completely unrelated. So let me come to the uh, let me come to the uh, to the future because it's more important to, to discuss the future than to discuss uh, the uh, the past. Uh, here I would like to uh, to uh, to make a strong uh, uh, to, to to express a strong opinion uh, that uh, the, um, um, the, syst the system we are living in currently uh, should not last too long. Um, we uh, we've seen uh, we've seen uh, public institutions in Europe, uh, governments on the one hand and the ECB on the other hand, with different considerations and different uh, and different mandates, uh, substituting uh, for the, the functioning of, uh, of private decentralized markets. Um, this could not be uh, the long term, the steady state uh, situation in Europe. Uh, financial integration should remain uh, uh, the prime objective of, uh, of all European authorities. Financial integration remains key uh, to, efficient, to the efficiency and to the competitiveness of the European economy. It has delivered a lot of benefits uh, between 1999 and 2007, so it would be, it would be totally, uh, totally uh, um, uh, um, absurd uh, from our side to, uh, to ignore the benefits of financial integration and to, uh, and to accept uh, uh, as a steady state uh, device a system where uh, the financing of European countries would be uh, performed uh, by public institutions. This is not the right way to go. Uh, the EU is a market-based economy, uh, and, uh, and decentralized markets should play the primary role in allocating the economic resources across the EU countries. Because we need price signals, and this, this point was made by Jan Werner, and I very much agree with him, that we need price signals at a decentralized level, uh, and we need risk, the monitoring of risks associated to the financing of, of government-wide uh, deficits and surpluses. Well, you could argue that before, uh, before 2007, we had a decentralized system uh, which uh, didn't deliver the appropriate monitoring of risks. So certainly also uh, there are uh, things to be changed uh, in terms of supervision uh, and maybe uh, in terms of the organization of the financial sector uh, in, the, in the private economy. But still, uh, without uh, coming back to this uh, decentralized uh, uh, allocation of resources, we won't have the right price signals and we won't have the right, the, the right uh, monitoring. In, uh, in so, so let me uh, let me outline some of the, of the priorities uh, that I would see uh, to uh, to revert to a uh, to a more uh, to a, to, a, uh, to an economic to, a, to an economically sensible uh, state state situation, uh, and let me break the discussion into four areas. Uh, first, um, we, we need uh, adjustment uh, in um, uh, in current account deficit countries. Uh, and we need to support, to continue to support the adjustment in these countries. Uh, so uh, there will be a continuation of, in particular, of, uh, of uh, IMF and European financing. Uh, now through the ESM, uh, which is the uh, which is a long-term mechanism, which make it possible to uh, to support uh, the adjustment in uh, in very poor countries. So it's it's, 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 the usual, it's adjustment and financing. This is the usual story. Uh, we 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 had a lot of financing. Now we need a lot of adjustment. Uh, looking forward, it will be very difficult. Um, uh, it, will be, it will be very challenging, but again, the example of Ireland shows that it's possible. We have the example of Latvia, this was discussed uh, uh, yesterday, yes, uh, which shows that it is possible. So it will be different uh, depending on, on countries, but uh, there is no other way out than to, uh, than to have this, uh, this uh, price level uh, adjustment in uh, in, uh, in And also, we have new institutional mechanisms to, to enforce that. We have a new um, imbalance, excessive imbalance procedure, uh, which will be managed by the European Commission, where the Commission will, uh, will identify uh, imbalances early on uh, and uh, will, uh, will uh, propose solutions, and ultimately uh, we could have sanctions on countries if they don't accept the solutions proposed by the European Commission and by other countries. So we have strong uh, institutional mechanisms to, uh, to monitor and to, to correct uh, current account imbalances in, uh, in Europe. This is the first avenue. The second avenue is on the, is on the fiscal side, and here it's pretty much, uh, again, along the line of, of uh, what uh, Hans Werner has said. Uh, the, uh, we have a new treaty of stability, <coughs> coordination, and governance uh, in, uh, in Europe, which is what is uh, commonly known as the fiscal compact. Uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it, um, 
include in particular uh, balanced budget rules at a constitutional level or quasi-constitutional level in, uh, in all uh, individual countries. And this should be uh, now uh, ratified promptly and, uh, and applied consistently. And again, this gives a great role to the European Commission because the European Commission will be the driving, will be the driving seat to uh, identify uh, fiscal imbalances and to... Uh, and um, let me just note here that the, the rules of the fiscal compact, uh, they concern the structural budget deficit. Uh, they don't concern the cyclical component of the budget. And so the, uh, it should make, make it possible to restore uh, some kind of uh, intertemporal sharing through the budget when uh, budget deficits are back to structural balance, because then uh, the, the structural balance will be enshrined into the international constitution. So it will be a much safer mechanism because the implementation will be at a national level through the, through the constitutional uh, mechanisms of each country, uh, rather than in, in Brussels through uh, the ECOFIN and the, uh, and, the, and the discussion with the European Commission. So it will be legally and uh, politically. Uh, uh, so this is an absolute priority for, uh, for European countries to, to go back to fiscal balance uh, and uh, so that they can recreate fiscal space to, uh, to, uh, to adapt to shocks. This was the second, uh, the second priority. Uh, the third priority, which is maybe the most important in my view, uh, is, to, is, to is, is to recreate financial markets in Europe. Uh, and this is a long-term project. Uh, there are many dimensions. Uh, certainly the ECB is not alone in that, uh, in that project. Uh, the ECB may have a role to play, but in coordination with the European Commission, which is in charge of, of enforcing and, and protecting the single market uh, for capitals. Uh, and also with European supervisory authorities, such as the uh, European Banking uh, Authority. Uh, it is absolutely indispensable that we can recreate a single market for, for capital in Europe. Uh, well, if you remember well, the, uh, uh, and for those of you who, who, who read the, the, Delors, the Delors report uh, early on, or the, or the, the Chiquini report uh, also uh, in the 90s, uh, the, in fact, the EMU, uh, the single currency, was introduced as a complement to the single market. It's very much a byproduct of the single market, the single market for goods and services, and uh, the single market for, cap for capital movements as uh, uh, created by the single act of 1992. And so it, it is really ironic that the outcome of this crisis is uh, the, the EMU uh, without capital mobility, because uh, EMU was created in a way to protect capital mobility uh, in the European Union. I mean, this is sort of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Mundell uh, impossible trilemma in a sense. <laughs> Another way to, to look at the story. <coughs> We've chosen this route of uh, free capital mobility within Europe and we needed a single currency. Now we have a single currency, but we don't have a capital mobility anymore. Um, of course, we, we will not return to the kind of financial integration that we had in the pre crisis era, because this, this the financial integration we had before the crisis, this is a kind of financial integration which led to the crisis. So we should certainly return to it. Uh, we should, we should, we should Right, other way to, to recreate uh, European capital markets. Um, uh, so, so there should be, let's call that a financial compact, which would complement the fiscal compact. We need these financial compacts with, with initiatives to recreate capital markets. Um, one uh, one uh, important uh, component, of course, uh, maybe the, maybe the short-term priority is to restore the capital adequacy of banks, because we need confidence, we need trust in European banks. This is, this is the priority. And the, the, capital, uh, the capital exercise of the European Banking uh, Authority goes a long way towards that direction. It may not be enough, we'll see, uh, but we need to restore trust in, uh, in European banks. Uh, a, second, a second component uh, would be to, uh, to reflect on the, uh, on the other uh, regulatory initiatives so as to make sure that they, they, don't, they don't create obstacles uh, to, the, to the restarting of the, of the interbank market. And here I'm thinking in particular of the liquidity ratio as foreseen in, uh, in the Basel III uh, uh, agreement. Uh, the liquidity ratio should be implemented in a way <coughs> that is not an obstacle uh, to, the, to the recreation or to the restarting of the interbank market, in particular in its cross-national dimension. So it should, not, it should not be an impediment for German banks to lend to Italian banks or for Dutch banks to lend to. And very much on the way this liquidity ratio will be implemented, uh, also at a national level by national uh, supervisor. Um, and also, uh, I would like to add that one of the priorities is to, is to break the link between the, the credit craziness of banks and the credit craziness of sovereigns. Uh, this is, of course, uh, one of the lessons of the current crisis. One, uh, there, are many, uh, there are many dimensions here, but uh, one uh, important uh, um, 
progress uh, would be to, to have an, an harmonized regime or bank resolution uh, in Europe, and maybe maybe later on uh, to have a single European agency uh, for deposit insurance uh, and for a winding down uh, thing. Without uh, a single authority uh, for banking resolution, uh, we, we, we won't disconnect uh, the credit of banks from the credit of sovereigns. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, there is not a lot of appetite uh, on the side of governments to do that, uh, but we should uh, we should begin. Uh, <coughs> and finally, the fourth aspect uh, is uh, is about uh, non-financial markets. It's about, in particular, the labor market. Uh, it has been forgotten uh, in this crisis that uh, part of the reasons why the euro area was uh, 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 why the functioning of the euro area could be improved is that uh, labor markets were, were, were not, not flexible enough and that uh, labor mobility was not enough across the euro area countries. So we, we, we are hearing now of, uh, of governments wanting to put forward growth initiatives, wanting to put growth back uh, on the European agenda. Uh, from, the, the stand, from the standpoint of the ECB, uh, growth initiatives are welcome, uh, provided that it's about uh, uh, potential growth. Uh, so it's provided that it's about supply-side reforms and not about additional public spending, which is an important uh, caveat. Uh, and this will be an interesting discussion with those uh, governments. Um, and also uh, provided that uh, the, uh, the promoters of these growth initiatives take the perspective of the single market, uh, as opposed to the perspective of, of national development. It's really our role as a, as a, uh, as a European institution to uh, work. Um, you may have noticed that my four points make little mention of the, of the ECB uh, as a solution to the, uh, to the crisis. Uh, this is because in our view, the, the single monetary policy can at best support uh, the required reforms. Uh, our best contribution can be to, to continue providing uh, liquidity, to liquidity to banks, uh, provided that they are sound, and provided that they have high quality collateral, uh, otherwise we, we should not provide liquidity to them, uh, and also to ensure the smooth functioning of the payment system, uh, and maybe above all, to, uh, to continue <coughs> to uh, price stability, and this will be our contribution. So let me, uh, let me conclude. Um, uh, I would like just as a way of conclusion to quote uh, the, uh, the, uh, the last lines of uh, James Ingram's uh, paper on European monetary integration, which was published in this uh, university uh, uh, 39 years ago. Uh, and uh, these are the last lines of uh, Ingram's uh, paper. It's obvious that the necessity for perfect confidence in the permanent fixity of exchange rates in the monetary integration ultimately confronts the reality of national sovereignty which implies the right and power of a nation to change its mind. Europe has so far resolved the potential conflict between sovereignty and federalism through negotiation and through compromise. Such resolution may become increasingly difficult as integration becomes closer. Without some signs of political unification, it may be particularly difficult to convince capital markets that exchange rates are irrevocably fixed. This is the conclusion of uh, Ingram's uh, paper uh, in uh, 1973. So uh, negotiation and compromise indeed have become more difficult as integration has become closer. Uh, but the EU is a union of democracies uh, and uh, European governments should be more trustful of the power of uh, democracy to uh, produce the solutions that will address the deep causes of the, of the crisis. Uh, signs of political unification, as, as referred to in the last paper, uh, are needed. Uh, they are needed uh, because we need to combat uh, the fragmentation of Europe we need to combat the fragmentation of uh, European markets, <coughs> uh, and we need also to uh, fight the temptation to raise national barriers uh, and uh, to take actions uh, uh, losing sight of the, uh, of the necessity to protect the single market. And all of these are political issues, and this is why uh, the Ostrom conclusion was very visionary. And with that, I will stop there.